Hi everybody, it's Rob Snaith here, and I'd like to welcome you to Fundamentals of Mechanical Engineering, Topic 1.1. Um, first of all, a couple of checks before we get underway. We do have a busy session today, so without further ado, can you all hear me clearly? Please indicate that you can hear me. Positive response, that's a good start. And now, can you see the arrow pointing to the letter M in mechanical? Cool, so we've got sound and we've got vision. Well, in this webinar, we're going to look at some basic concepts uh, concerning work, power, energy, force, torque. And we're also going to look at some drawings and friction, amongst other things. Let's start off with force. Well, force is a push or a pull on, on, on an object that results from its uh, interaction with another object. So here we've got a force of 100 newtons, uh, because that's the units that we measure force in. And we're applying this to this column at an angle of 45 degrees, 5 meters from the bottom here. So engineers like to do cool things. So uh, engineers could work out how much this column moves because of this force applied here. And uh, we could even work out things like bending stresses. But not to worry you just now. <laughs> More about that later. Now, the force is a, a product uh, of mass times acceleration. That mass being measured in kilograms. and our friend acceleration, of course, being measured in meters per square second. And this equation here, F equals mass times acceleration, is known as Newton's second law of motion. If we're going to do work, it means that we have to do um, uh, or, or produce a, a, a move of force through a distance. So the definition here um, of work is when a body moves under the influence of a force, work is done. So we calculate work by multiplying force times the distance through which we move the object. Energy, well, we know that energy can't be created or destroyed. And um, the, energy, uh, the unit of energy is the joule. And there are basically two formats that uh, energy can take uh, um, uh, a form in. The first one is potential energy. That's the energy stored in springs, for example, uh, the energy that a body has uh, due to its height. Uh, if you think about a, 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 a tank, a water tank suspended uh, above a tap. Um, the higher that tank is suspended above the tap, um, the more water uh, will come out um, as the, uh, the, 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 the tap is, uh, is opened, the more pressure we'll have. Kinetic energy, well, it comes from the, the, letter, the, the, the Greek kini, meaning motion. Kinetic energy is the energy possessed by a body by virtue of its motion. And these are basic things that we're going through now, guys. So uh, we've got to become familiar with them uh, because we will be using them later. Um, potential energy, we can calculate that by taking the mass of the object, multiplying the, 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 the distance between the object and some datum that we set, uh, multiplied by g, the gravitational constant. Kinetic energy, well, we can calculate that by taking a half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared, and the velocity will be in meters per second. Okay, now we're getting to some useful stuff now. Power. Well, power is the rate of doing work. And the way we can calculate power is uh, by measuring the force multiplied by its, uh, its average velocity. And the unit of power is the watt. Well, in industry, there are not many things that we measure in watts unless you're in electronics. Uh, normally, the machinery that we're um, utilizing for driving pumps and compressors, for example, uh, or, or uh, 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 conveyors uh, is measured in kilowatts. Now, torque is basically 
that is force times radius of application. So you can see here we've got a 10 kilogram force on a spanner and we're applying that force at a distance of one meter from the center of this, this bolt here. So we get a torque uh, of, of, of 10 kilogram force meters. So the further away this force is applied, the more torque we get. The higher this force becomes here uh, over a given distance, the more torque we get. So torque is a product of force times distance of application from, in this case, the center of the bolt. That's useful if you want to tighten spanners, uh, tighten the bolts rather. Now, friction is something that engineers love and hate. Uh, friction um, is, uh, is uh, the enemy when we're looking at rotating equipment. Friction is the friend when we want to stop that rotating equipment from moving. And uh, the resisting force uh, is called friction force. Now, there are some laws of friction. There's basically four laws that we, we need to be familiar with. The first law is frictional force is directly proportional to the normal load between the surfaces for any pair of materials. The second law says that friction force depends on the material from which the contact surfaces are made. So if we have really rough surfaces, then we will have a high friction force between them when we try to move them. And the second law says the friction force for pure sliding is independent of the area of contact of the surfaces. And then the fourth law is that the friction force is independent of the velocity of the sliding of one body relative to the other. And here's a couple of examples. Um, if we looked under the microscope at surfaces that might look to the human eye to be um, smooth, we see we've got this kind of surface here that looks like the moon. And the friction is caused by these tiny little bumps called asperities. Uh, and the, the, the friction is caused by these bumps rubbing each other. Now, what did you think the purpose of a lubricant is, guys? What do you think one of the purposes of a lubricant is? If we take a look at this little sketch here, what do you think one of the purposes of a lubricant would be? Well, obviously to reduce friction, but what, what would it be? Aha, someone's on the ball. That's right. Well done, guys. We would want to fill these little gaps and separate, separate the two surfaces so they do not come into contact. And that is one of the uh, purposes of a lubricant. And once these uh, surfaces are separated, then obviously we reduce the coefficient of friction between the two surfaces. So as I say, engineers are in constant uh, turmoil as to whether they want friction or they don't want friction. It depends which side of the fence you're on. Um, here we've got a block um, with a, a, a normal reaction here of N. And we've got a frictional force F that we're applying parallel to this, this, uh, this base, if you like. And this frictional force is the amount of force that we need to apply to this block in order to get it moving. Now, the friction um, um, between uh, the, the two blocks um, depends on the surface roughness. And we've got something called the coefficient of friction. And it's denoted by the, the Greek letter mu. And we can calculate the coefficient of friction between any two surfaces if we know the force that's required to drag, the, in this case, the block along, and we know what the normal reaction force is. And here's a table. I don't know if you can see this very clearly on your screens, but let's take a couple of examples here. Uh, let's take cast iron. Cast iron, um, when we're sliding, has a coefficient of friction of, point, uh, of 0 0.15. If we take graphite, ooh, sliding, well, it's, it's 0.1. So 
it's 0.1. It's a lot less than cast iron. And cast iron is actually uh, very good uh, because it's filled with graphite. Let's take, let's take iron. Iron has a coefficient of friction there of about 1. So you can see we can get these uh, values for mu um, for different materials. Now I just want to explain, although this is not on your slides, you see that we've got two columns here. One says static, one says sliding. Well, in order to get the, 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 the block, if we go back a couple of uh, slides, in order to get this block moving, we have to overcome friction, static friction. So if I drew a little graph here, and here's the force, what will happen is, is as I increase the force, I increase the force to try and get it moving, and then once I've got it moving, that's the force to keep it moving. So this here, if I can just show you here, is the static friction. And once it's moving, that is the 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 the, the, uh, the 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 friction here in this table here. That's the sliding friction. There's my little pointer. So that static friction is this value here, and then where the, the curve flattens out, that is the sliding friction. So that, I hope that explains this, the, the two. There are different values there. So, as I said, engineers always have this dilemma. Some want friction, others don't want friction. And friction is pretty useful if you're walking um, or you're running. Um, also, if you're driving, it happens to be uh, very useful if you want to stop your car in a hurry. Um, if we didn't have friction, you'd be in big trouble. Uh, as this sketch shows here, we have a, a belt transmitting drive from the engine to various components, the alternator, the air conditioner, uh, the fuel pump, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and that relies on friction. So in this case, friction is good. Okay. As I said at the beginning, we've got a lot of stuff to get through, and it's very diverse here, guys. So uh, let's move on to the next subject, which is drawings drawings. Now, drawings are the, the, the main line of communication between the draftsman, the originator of the drawing itself, and the end user. Uh, and the example given here is between the designer and the machine operator. And it's important that we're able to communica communicate what the, the draftsman wants the operator, the machine operator, whatever, to produce. So the things that are really important in drawings are the type of projection that we use, any sections, cross sections shown on the drawing. As we'll see, they're very, very useful in supplying information. And then we're going to look at uh, assembly drawings, and then we're going to discuss tolerances and fits. So let's look at projections. Well, we've got two main um, uh, projection types, that's isometric and oblique. And the difference is that in isometric um, projection, you can see that um, the uh, cube here that's shown here is at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. So it's the side here is 30 degrees. In an oblique projection, we actually see a true representation of the side of the cube, and one side is, to, is at 45 degrees. At 45 degrees there. Now, just to further complicate things, we have two systems that we use. The first system is called first angle projection, which is mainly used in Europe. And you can see here we've got front view, side view, and plan view. Similarly, in third angle projection, which our American friends um, favor, we've got three views as well. But look at the placement. We've got plan view here on the top, front view below it, and side view. Now, how I remember, I've got a little trick that I use. And it's something like this. 
um, if I can find a color and a pen, I don't know what this is going to look like. I divide the drawing oh, up into three quadrants, four quadrants, sorry. This is the first, this is the second, this is the third, and this is the fourth. Now where is the front view in third angle projection? Where is the front view in third angle projection? In which quadrant is it? Okay, everybody passed that tough question. Now let's look at first angle projection. Let's divide this into four again. Here's my first quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant, and fourth quadrant. Where is my front view now? Which quadrant is it in? First. So that's a little trick I use, guys. I, you know, everybody has their own, own methodology for, 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 for these sort of things. That's how I remember when I'm looking at a drawing, whether, you know, I don't have to look at the name or where it was printed in order to ascertain what type of projection it is. Now, I hope you'll find that useful to you. Moving on. Sectional views are very, very useful. They're, they're so powerful, guys. They really help you understand what's going on, what you're looking at um, when you look at a drawing. And a sectional view is a, a, an imaginary slice through um, a, an, an object so that you can see what it looks like. Now here, in the top view here, what we're looking at is we're looking at what looks like a cylinder with a hole drilled in the middle and some kind of hidden object here. But look, if we didn't have a sectional drawing, we'd think that that hole went right through, wouldn't we? In natural fact, it doesn't. This full section view, and these, these lines here are called cross-hatching, this full section view shows us that that hole is only in the top half of this object. It doesn't actually go all the way through. Um, here is a half section uh, which we sometimes use. Now let's take a look at this one here on the right. This is mind-blowing. Look at this view here. So what we have is in this part, the first part of the object here, we've got two solid lines. Now that could be a groove or it could be a raised portion like it's shown here. Then we've got a center line here. What do you think this could be? What, what, what section do you think this could be? Just looking at this drawing here, what type of section do you think that could be? Those two lines there, what, what could they represent? Well, we see one of these things is that, yeah, it's round, but what other section could it be? Stefan, it wouldn't be a scallop. I know what you're saying is that it's like a, 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 a U section. You wouldn't see a center line there. It could be an oval. Yes, it could be. Good one. The other thing, what about it? It could be a rectangle or it could be a square, couldn't it? What we're seeing is two lines here and this are four lines here. So by taking a, a cross section, in this, in this case here, BB, BB shows us the section is actually round. How about this guy here? It shows you a square hole in there. What else could this be here? Represented by two dotted lines here. What else could that be? shows here in the section it's actually square, but what else could it be here? Well, it could be a round hole, couldn't it? It could, could be drilled. Um, <laughs> yeah, it could be round. Here it's shown square, in actual fact. So can you see how this is, uh, this is all hidden detail here? It's all hidden detail but how using 
um, sectional views, how a lot more information is revealed. And that's why these are, are, are very powerful details um, on a drawing, very useful to someone that's got to manufacture this. How about these sectional views? Let's take a look at this plate here. Wow. Well, this this is countersunk, but is it is it a square countersunk or is it a taper countersunk? Because look at this hole here on the right, and look at that hole there on the right. They look exactly the same in this view, don't they? But now take a look in the cross section. We can see this is actually countersunk square, countersunk tapered. How about this one? <laughs> this obviously it's shown in, in detail uh, in, in dotted um, lines. That would go actually three quarters of the way around there to represent a tapped hole. Look at this. That looks the same as that and the same as that, doesn't it? But in this case, it's actually a raised face here. It's a raised section that's been spot faced. It's been machined and it's round. It happens to be round. So, wow. Do I, do I need to explain any more about how powerful sectional views are? They do reveal a lot of information, don't they? Let's talk about dimensions. Well, why do we need di dimensions, guys? Why do we need dimensions? Now, don't give me any of these answers here, <laughs> because it's all at the, the, that's all in front of me as well as in front of you. But what other reason do you think, apart from what's here on the slide, do we need dimensions on a drawing? Well, we, yes, um, we've got some pretty good answers there. But, folks, the answer that I was looking for is if you have drawings on a, 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 a sorry, a, a drawing with dimensions on, we said that the purpose of, of drawings are to communicate between the draftsman and the operator, the machinist. Now, the operator, the machinist, makes the part according to the drawing. How do we know it's right? How do you, how do we know how do we know the machinist has made the part correctly? Yes, Scott. <laughs> On the money, bullseye. Yes, Bruce. Yes, Roy. We compare the dimensions that we measure on the actual manufactured part against those stated in the drawings. Now, just a word about drawings here before we start talking about limits and tolerances, because I'm just bringing us into the next subject a little bit prematurely. Take a look at this drawing. Can anybody tell me why we would say this part here? Look, imagine this: we've got two drawings, mirror image of each other. This this part here. There's a mirror image of that part. Take a look at the way that they're dimensioned. What strikes you as being the reason we've labeled this side, the left-hand side drawing, to be correct and this one incorrect? We've got all the dimensions that we need here on this, this part here on the right all the dimensions that we need on the left. But why would we say that this drawing dimension here is correct and this one is incorrect? Well, I'll give you a little bit. Well, yeah, the first thing that, that strikes you is the dimensioning here on the right 
is nowhere near as clear as the dimensioning on the left. It's a lot neater. Also, we're working from a datum. If you're a machinist, I need to know how far away from this side here to put this hole in and that hole in there and then this hole in here. So it's very easy. I don't have to add up the dimensions um, in, in this drawing. But the, the, you guys got it right. You said we um, um, are aware that the reason that this is correct is because the drawing is a lot tidier. It's a lot easier to understand. Um, we don't have any dimensions that are actually on the drawing. They're away from the drawing so we can actually see the part much clearer. I mean, this is really confusing. What do you think would happen if we sent this down to the machine shop for the machinist to manufacture? What do you think that, that might happen there? Absolutely, people. 100% correct. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> if I was the machinist, I wouldn't be impressed by the drawing either. Yeah, <laughs> you should. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, but there's always a, 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 there's a much greater risk of, of producing um, the wrong article. Um, the machinist would have to, to sit there and try and work through this maze of dimensions as to how to produce this article. And yes, Justin. Yeah, it takes time, and time, as we know, is money. So, yeah, um, <laughs> bigger chance here of producing scrap uh, when compared to this dimensioned uh, uh, part of the drawing. Good one. Very good. Okay, moving on. Um, another useful drawing for us, um, especially if we're going to put parts together as an assembly drawing. And uh, an assembly drawing shows how things are put together. And generally, um, they, they, one, one can um, as, assemble it. It's like a Lego set, um, if, we, if we look at this. Now, the assembly drawing shows how things go together, and we have a parts list along with the drawing. What do you think the parts list helps us to achieve? What purpose does the parts list um, serve, should I say? Yes, Scott. Yes. It identifies the components. Because bear in mind, people, this is an assembly drawing, but each individual part has to be machined. So in, in this column here, it says description, there's a part Part number, uh, well, actually, that's the part description, really, to be to be strictly um, uh, strict. Uh, th this is the the uh, description. It should be a, there should be a number in here, um, a, a machining drawing number in here, so that we can identify the component. Also, when you look at the parts list, it tells you how many of each part we need, and um, that's also useful, isn't it? The x-axis, no, um, Daniel, the x is a section. It's just to show that this drawing is a section view, viewing on AA. So in other words, I take a hacksaw, I cut this imaginary hacksaw, I cut this in half, and what I'm seeing here on the right of the drawing is the view that I would get if I looked at the component once it's cut in half from left to right. Any idea what this might be, guys? What this component might be? Yeah, it's a hydraulic piston. It's a hydraulic piston. I, I actually believe it's off the brake uh, master cylinder. Oh, well done, Bruce. Yeah. Um, I believe it's off the brake master cylinder. Well, it doesn't tell you that there. Well done, you guys are on the ball today. Wow, look at this exploded assembly. I did say it shows us how things go together. Um, I think this is pretty good um, in, in determining where where we are, how how um, things um, um, 
fit together, where they should go. And you'll notice we've also got item numbers on here. What is the purpose of those item numbers? Why do we have nine item numbers on an exploded assembly? Yeah, OK. Yep, you guys are definitely awake. It's to identify the parts uh, and to go back and look at the so we can go back, refer to the actual uh, manufacturing drawing. Good. Now, before we talked about um, you know dimensioning things and um, manufacturing things, and hopefully we'd get them get them right. Now, we're going to talk a little bit now about limits and fits. And the, the, the limits of size are the extreme dimensions, the maximum size, the minimum size, uh, which it's permissible for a component to, to, be, to be made. Now, designers often calculate and, and design uh, a shaft to fit in their hole. Now, the, the, the cost of the, the manufacturing of this depends on the limits that we uh, apply to the shaft and to the hole. If we make the, 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 the dimensions of the shaft extremely tight, in other words, we um, allow very, very, very little for manufacturing errors, then that shaft will be expensive to manufacture. And often, the designers decide what the, uh, the final dimensions should be for, for mating parts. Um, now, limits are normally used uh, for cylindrical holes and shafts, but they can use, be used on any part, uh, or parts rather, that fit together, uh, regardless of, of, of what they look like. Now, typically, um, a limit is the upper and lower uh, tolerance uh, for a, a, a shaft or hole. Now, we've got different types of fit between components. We can have a clearance fit where um, a, um, a, a pump shaft fits into a plane bearing. And that shaft rotates in the bearing, hopefully with some kind of lubrication there. Um, and that is a clearance fit. An interference fit is where there's an, a negative allowance. Um, you may want to put two halves of a tool together with a dowel. And the, the dowel size is slightly larger than the, uh, the hole size in, in one half of the tool. And then we've got something that's in between a clearance fit and an interference fit. It's called a transitional fit. Let's take a look at an example here. So we're looking at a drawing of a housing, a bearing bush, and a shaft here, and a shaft. What type of fit do you think that there is between the bearing bush and the housing? So this shaft will rotate in this bearing bush, and this is fitted inside the housing. Well, yes, it's, it's an interference fit. It's pressed. The bush would be pressed into the housing so that it doesn't rotate. Now, let's look at the shaft. We've got the shaft rotating in this bearing bush here. Now, ignore the drawing. What type of fit would you think that the shaft is in the bearing bush. Oh, some of you are, yeah, you got it already. You got it, well done, guys. It's a clearance fit. It's a clearance fit. So what we would do in this case of this assembly is we would put nominal sizes for the shaft, the bearing bush, and the housing, and put clearances, I'm sorry, put tolerances on to ensure that we get the correct fit. And our designers refer to ISO limits and fits. And there's a standard, which is British standards uh, 4500, um, which is a, an abbreviated table, if you like. Um, and you'll see the table in a moment, and you'll understand immediately why we use letters 
um, it's a shorthand basically on on a drawing now all we have to know for the sake of this webinar is that holes are designated by a capital letter and shafts are designated by a lower case so we've got H11 H9 H8 H7 which refers to holes and then we've got C11 D10 E9 etc etc which refers to shafts and here's the table here guys now can you imagine producing a drawing and then having to write free running fit not for use where accuracy is essential but good for temp large temperature variations high running speeds are heavy to walk I'm getting tired just saying it imagine having to put all of this text on a drawing when you can just do this h9 d9 <laughs> which would you prefer to do write all of this out or put this in your on your drawing I think I know what the answer is going to be before I even see um, you reply to that one so under clearance fits we have all of these symbols that one would refer to um, and these go from loose running to location clearance and all of these are defined by the large uh, letter H and a lower case letter here in this case D transition then we've got different types of transition there's the locational transition fit for accurate location and it's a compromise between clearance that's a rattling fit and an interference fit where it really has to be pressed in and then we've got location trans uh, transition fit for more accurate location where we've got very very little clearance at all and we're having to um, make sure that the parts uh, that are fitting together don't move and you see the difference here we've got H7 what is the lar large letter designate just checking that you're awake <laughs> okay so in, the, in both cases we've got an H7 and in the first case we've got a K6 and the second case we've got an N6 so this is all this is guys is an abbreviated way of saying this to the machinist and the, 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 the everybody that's reading the drawing and here we've got an example here there's a little calculator that shows us that we've got an H8 H7 here our nominal shaft size is 10 millimeters and we can see here the tolerance we've got here um, H8 which is your hole size can be 10 millimeters plus 22 microns and not any smaller so it can be 10 millimeters plus 22 mi microns plus nothing so it's either 10 millimeters or 10.022 millimeters that's your hole and similarly for the shaft the shaft is not going to be any bigger than 10 millimeters but it can be 10 millimeters minus 0 minus 15 and that's the why or, or how we tolerance things oh sorry uh, in order to get the desired fit Whew. <laughs> moving on let's now discuss engineering materials and this is important guys engineers need to know how materials behave under different conditions now let's get something out of the way the difference between tension and compression is if you compress something you press it together you push them push these loads are pushing together in tension we're pulling apart we're pulling apart so if a spring is being compressed is it going to get larger or smaller its dimensions its length if a spring is being compressed will it get smaller or larger well wow, I'm so glad you guys said smaller <laughs> okay so we've got the the, the the terminology right now 
force uh, is applied to, uh, this, in this case, this load or P is applied to a, a, a rod of cross-sectional area A0. And in this case, we've got a load that's pulling these apart. That's in tension. So both of those um, uh, rods would be under stress. One would be being compressed, the other one would be being um, stretched. And the stress in both cases would be the load that we apply divided by the cross-sectional area. Strain is the deformation of the component um, divided by its original length. Now, stresses can be shear stresses, where we're trying to chop something in half, or they can be torsional stresses, where we're trying to twist something, um, or it can be a, a tensile stress, or a compressive stress, as we saw before. Now, we can't measure stress itself, but we can measure deformation. We can measure the change in cross-section. So if we talk about normal stress, Normal stress is the force per unit area, that's P, divided by the cross-sectional area, A0. And sigma is the stress in newtons per square meter. So P must be in newtons and area must be in square meters. Wow, tough maths, tough maths. Now, <laughs> this cartoon, um, yeah. Is this going to be tensile stress here or compressive stress? Do you think this zebra is, is undergoing? If we're pulling something off him, pulling his stripes off. Is it tensile or compressive stress? Oh, I think it's, it's tensile stress. <laughs> okay. All right. And here we've got a picture of a lab. And these are, 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 are uh, pieces of equipment called tensometers. Uh, what they do is they, they um, uh, allow us to put samples in between two jaws, so there's a lower jaw and an upper jaw there, and then we apply a load and we stretch the, 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 the tensile test object, and we measure the load and the reduction in cross-sectional area, and that helps us calculate the tensile strength of the material. Now, I'm going to show you a sketch in a moment uh, that explains um, th this, this particular slide. But when we talk about elastic, elastic deformation uh, in steels or in materials, what elastic deformation means is, is if we apply a, a, a load to a, a piece of material and it stretches, if we reduce uh, or, or, or take away the load, that piece uh, of, of, of steel will go back to its original shape. That's elastic defam uh, deformation. And um, we're able to measure this um, in the laboratory and um, doing tensile tests. So if we want to find out the, uh, the, 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 the tensile stress uh, of a piece of material, then we apply this formula. Well, we know that sigma is the stress. E is Young's modulus of elasticity that's measured in gigapascals. And then E, this epsilon, uh, is the strain. And the strain is dimensionless. It's a change in, in, uh, in length divided into the original length. It's the change. So it's dimensionless. And for different materials, the, the value of uh, Young's uh, modulus of elasticity, capital E here, can vary anywhere between 45 gigapascals right up to 407 gigapascals. It really depends on the material. Now, here we've got a stress-strain diagram, and there's strain. This is, this is supposed to be little epsilon. You can see that it's the change in length divided by the original length. That's why it's dimensionless. And here's our stress. That's load divided by cross-sectional area. So if we look at this solid line of this curve, 
This is a tensile test on a piece of material where we're measuring stress that we apply against strain. That's the stretch um, of the material. And here you can see a sample, shape of a sample. Now, in this region here where we've got a linear relationship between stress and strain, this is called the limit uh, of proportionality. In other words, stress is proportional to strain. It's linear. It's linear. Then we get to a point here that we call the elastic limit. Now, in other words, the elastic limit is that stress applied to the material um, that will, when it's removed, allow the material to go back to its original dimension. Once we get above that limit, that tensile stress limit, we get what we call plastic deformation. So in other words, if I released the, the stress, if I re released the load, my tensile test object here would not go back to this original shape. And what happens is we get something called necking. And you can see we get a reduction in diameter of the tensile test sample. And what's interesting is that here we get something called the UTS, the ultimate tensile strength. Once we get past that UTS point, look what happens here. I don't have to apply any more load. The material is saying, oh, goodbye, I'm failing. And then we get fracture of the, the, the tensile test uh, um, uh, sample. And I just want to show you in a moment what those look like. So the proportional limit is the stress at which the linear relationship between stress and, fail, uh, and, and, and strain fails to exist. That is the limit of proportionality or proportional limit as they have on this slide here. Once you pass that point, it's the point of no return. Now engineers, when they design, uh, whether it's a bridge, whether it's a rope, for, for, for uh, 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 a, a drag um, in, a, in, a, in a quarry, they're always designing to make sure that we never ever stress a material past this point here, because that can lead to failure. Now yield stress, I've mentioned before, that's where we get yielding of the material, and then we get plastic deformation occurring. Strain hardening is, if you look at the sample, you could see the, the grain structure you know, under a microscope. You could see the grain structure of the material is actually starting to change. Um, and that's what's doing the damage. Um, let's talk about engineering uh, uh, material properties for a moment. Stiffness. That's how much a component will deflect or not deflect uh, under a, a, a given uh, load. Um, we've given a, a stiff material here, diamond. Diamond does not change under uh, very, very heavy loads. Um, rubber, on the other hand, it doesn't take much to change the shape of a piece of rubber. So diamond would have a very, very high um, uh, Young's modulus of elasticity. And rubber, of course, would have a very, very low modulus of elasticity. Ductility, that's defined really as the ability of a material to be drawn into wires. Strength, the strength of a material is the ability of, of that material to resist deformation. Now, when we're talking about failure mechanisms, Engineers, when they're designing equipment, have to take all of these five failure mechanisms into account when they're designing equipment. Well, fracture is defined quite simply as a separation of a body into two or more pieces. And let's hope if we design something that we never ever see fracture occurring. Now, 
fracture can occur under conditions of compressive stress, shear stress, and torsional stress. And there's definitely two steps in the process that occurs before we have ultimately a fracture on our hands. And that is the formation of cracks and then the propagation of cracks. And we've got two possible fracture modes. There's fracture occurring under ductile conditions and fracture occurring under brittle conditions. Now, let me show you the samples of these tensile test objects that I was talking about before. Imagine those tensile uh, uh, test machines with tensometers um, producing a load uh, uh, on, on samples until they actually fracture. Um, this would show you the different samples um, of different materials and the fractures that we get depending on the ductility of the of the um, of the sample. Here we can see that we've got necking that's really, really visible. So in other words, this material has stretched and stretched and stretched and then bang, it's it's broken. This is a, uh, indicative of a very highly ductile uh, material, something like copper, something like aluminium. Here, we see there's been a definite reduction in the size of the sample up to the point of fracture. And then at the point of fracture, now we can see this sawtooth pattern here where the, the samples are torn apart um, from each other. So this is what we call a moderately ductile fracture. Um, you'd see that in um, um, some um, stainless steels, uh, for example. And then on here, on this particular one here, we've got brittle fracture. You can see no reduction in cross-section here. And what happens is we load the sample, it doesn't stretch. We load the sample more, it doesn't stretch. We load the sample more, it doesn't stretch. And then what happens is we reach the ultimate tensile strength of the material without it having stretched, and then bang, it just gives way. And this is uh, indicative of a, um, a, a highly brittle material. Any ideas what that might be? Well, can you think of a highly brittle material, a highly brittle metal? for example. A highly brittle metal. Yep, well, cast iron is a, is, is a very, very common uh, material that is very brittle. Tungsten, you said, is, is, is brittle as well. Titanium, Mm, I think in titanium you're going to see this one is moderately ductile. Tining, tining uh, is uh, is that high speed steel? Yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be there um, on the uh, on the on the brittle fracture. Brass? No, you will see some necking on the sample before it gives way. So brass is is moderately ductile. Glass? <laughs> well, it's definitely brittle. <laughs> you ever stretch, try to stretch a pane of glass? I haven't, but uh, it would be interesting to see if you could. Now, yeah, glass is definitely brittle. <laughs> now, with ductile uh, fracture, uh, the, the process is we get a very slow crack propagation. If we reduce the load, then the crack becomes stable, uh, and it's not a great situation to be in, but we, 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 won't, uh, we won't get any, any, any uh, fracture occurring unless we reapply the load and, and carry on doing that until we get to a certain um, stage where we've got plastic deformation, where the material has visibly stretched, and we know around the corner fractures just waiting to happen. So that's, that's ductile fracture. With brittle fracture, it's the other extreme. What happens is you get very, very little, if any, deformation at the fracture site. 
And, you know, as I said before, we apply a load, keep on applying it, keep on applying it, and then bang, it goes. And it goes very, very suddenly. Um, you get rapid crack propagation. And a brittle fracture is extremely quick. Uh, and it can be very catastrophic. Other failures that we um, uh, can see in, in construction are um, dynamic stresses um, and, and fluctuating stresses. Uh, this is where the stresses are going up and down and the dynamic stresses are, are going back and forth. And what's happened here in this pretty little picture is this boat has broken in half. It's broken in half due to fluctuating stresses. Um, I'm glad I didn't design that. <laughs> Here's some examples of fatigue. Uh, we've got a truck with a, a, a ladder on here, and oh dear, the ladder has broken, and okay, it's bent as well. How about this? This is an example of fatigue. We've got a jet aircraft engine where the, uh, the, the, the blades of the jet engine flew apart, and they just burst the casing of the of the jet engine. So these are things people that engineers have to design out. Um, so we've got to really be uh, 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 aware of these things. Um, another um, form of stress is corrosion. Now corrosion basically people is what? Can can somebody give me a a, a definition of corrosion, but a very, very simple one? Okay, we've got some. We've got some pretty ones. T to me, a corrosion is is a, a, a loss of material due to a chemical and electrical reaction. It's a loss of material. It can be gradual or it can be rapid, um, but it's a loss of material. And um, if we lose material, um, then we lose strength. Now, there are two types of corrosion that we're going to look at in this webinar. That's uniform and localized corrosion. With uniform corrosion, as the name implies, it happens all, all, over, the, 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 all over the surface, and basically um, the, uh, the corrosion rate is the same over the surface of the material. And things that can, can affect um, uh, corrosion, uniform corrosion, are low pH, things that are very, very acidic, dissolved oxygen, dissolved carbon dioxide. Another one here is high temperatures. High temperatures can accelerate corrosion. And here's some examples of uniform corrosion. You can see this floor, this steel floor has been eaten away. And you can see the corrosion there is uniform. Um, I don't know who was standing there before that gave way, but anyway. <laughs> You can see that that's, that's, that's happened here in this construction site. And another example is where we've got a pillar in seawater. And you can see where the, where the high tide is here, can't you? OK, there we've got a good example of uniform corrosion. Localized corrosion is where we've got non-uniform loss of material over the surface of, of the component. And things that affect that are carbon dioxide, calcium chlorides, especially in stainless steels um, that are, are uh, uh, that contain um, calcium chlorides, and um, that can can affect local corrosion. And here we can see an example of localized corrosion. This is so localized here that it's actually gone right through the material. And there's some examples here on the right-hand side here of uh, localized corrosion. Um, we've got something called here SOHIC, S-O-H-I-C. Does anybody know what SOHIC is? Well, the, the letters S-O-H-I-C stand for stress-oriented hydrogen-induced cracking. It's a fancy name for 
uh, what happens when we get uh, hydrogen sulfide corrosion. You know, hydrogen sulfide, that's the, the stuff that, that, that smells like bad eggs. If you've ever been in a refinery, you can smell it often. Um, that's sulfur, sulfur, I'll say it in English, hydrogen sulfide uh, attacking uh, weak points in the material here. And galvanic corrosion. Can anybody give me an example of where galvanic corrosion occurs? Uh, no hint, but I think the name might give it away. Where do you think galvanic corrosion occurs? In steel and aluminium? Yes, that's for sure. What else have I got? Aluminium and stainless steel bolt? Yes. Uh, underwater on ship's hulls? Uh, the pr propellers? Yes. Good example. Bruce, brilliant example. Uh, you, you, you got what I was hinting at there. Galvanized steel, people. That's where it happens there. So the, the, in, in, in galvanized steel, for example, the zinc, which is the galvanizing, sacrifices itself to protect the steel. And we've got two dissimilar metals in contact with each other, with each other uh, steel and copper. And if we looked at the galvanic series, the table, um, in the galvanic series, we see that in actual fact zinc and uh, steel are fairly close together. If you looked at that same table and looked at copper, now copper could protect steel, but steel and copper are further apart in the galvanic series. And what will happen is if you copper plate steel and compare the life of its uh, uh, ability to protect the steel, you'll find it shorter than the zinc under the same conditions. Here we've got crevice corrosion. Um, this is where we, we get a concentration um, uh, where we've got, it can be dissimilar materials. Um, it can happen under the, the, the heads of washers. And I think someone gave me an example there of aluminium and steel, uh, steel bolts. Um, definitely could get get that where you've got dissimilar metals and you've got some kind of electrolyte. It could be water, it could be leaked product, whatever. You can also get it um, in gaskets. Uh, you get um, steel gaskets that um, can uh, accelerate corrosion uh, if they're not uh, selected, if the material is not selected uh, properly. And stress corrosion cracking, SCC, well, we see that in sulfuric acid tank, uh, tanks where um, the, the chlorides, sorry, in hydrochloric acid uh, tanks uh, uh, that are made from stainless steel, where the chlorides and the acid actually attack the steel where it's been stressed. And, um, you know, when the tank is being filled up, uh, it expands. Uh, so the steel is being stressed, it, it's, it's being stretched, and then when the tank empties, then the steel is being compressed. It's trying to get back to its original shape. Um, springs, for example, um, mechanical steel manufacturers, to reduce the cost of, of producing their mechanical seals, often make the springs out of stainless steel. Now that's fine if you are um, using them on water that has very, very low chloride content. Um, but if you've got anything that's got any significant amount of chlorides in, what will happen is that spring will crack and it will fail and the mechanical seal will ultimately fail. How about this example of fatigue corrosion? What you've got here is you've got the presence of stress along with corrosion. So the parts uh, are, are stressed psychically, and um, you've got the added um, uh, devil of, of corrosion. So that accelerates, they, 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 they feed on each other and accelerate each other. Oh, and that brings us to the end. Now, you'll see there's a slide here of a roller assembly. Your 
assignment question asks you to show an assembled sectioned view of this roller as assembly. So I just wanted to explain what we're looking for in that question. Um, because uh, last time we ran this workshop, uh, a lot of people said, well, well, we don't understand what you're looking for. What we're looking for is you to do us a drawing of this assembly sectioned. So imagine I took a hacksaw and I cut down the center of this roller along this axis and I cut right through there and then all the way down through there. So I cut this whole assembly in half from top to bottom. What we're looking for is what would the view look like with this thing sectioned, with this thing cut in half. Are you all with me on that, that one there? Is, is, that, is that clear, people? What we're looking for? Great. Well, then, good luck with that question. Um, and uh, I'm glad you were... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Justin, it doesn't have to be done. <laughs> it doesn't have to be done on computer. Um, a a hand-drawn sketch, as long as it's clear, and it shows the components, um, you can draw it by hand. What we're looking for, people, is your, uh, you, <laughs> you, can, you can draw it by CAD if you want. Um, and uh, when you say, Bruce, what format do you want to send? Just please explain that. Well, it'll be, it, it, well, it, remember, it'll be, uh, uh, well, you can do it in PDF, you can do it on, uh, on whatever. Remember, it's going to go on your exam paper. So um, if you're going to do it, uh, um, you might want to do it by hand um, and then, uh, then scan it and bring it, put it into your, into your exam paper, whatever, whatever suits you. At the end of the day, what we're looking for is your understanding of what this assembly would look like if we cut it in half and we looked at it from the direction of letter A. So you've got one section, it's cut all the way through there, but don't forget, it's one drawing, it's one drawing, but it's going to show different components sectionalized, isn't it? And that's the only hint I'm going to give you on this. The rest you're going to have to think through. So it'll be one drawing showing a sectionalized view of this roller assembly. Um, people, uh, the, the, uh, I'm just the lecturer. Um, the um, uh, assignments will be given to you by EIT, um, and you'll find them normally on Moodle. Find them on Moodle. Okay, people. Um, are there any questions on anything we've done in this module that you'd like to ask now? Um, I usually put my uh, email address on the very, very last slide. Um, but for you guys that, uh, well, actually, you'll, you'll get all of these slides on Moodle. Uh, but if you want to make a note of my email address, if there's anything that you want to ask me. Um, apart from the answers to the <laughs> to the, the assignments, um, you're more than welcome. I'll try and I get back to you. I am away from Saturday. Um, I'm being sent to Mauritius on business, people on business. Um, so I won't be able to answer anything until uh, the week after next. There must be a, an easier way to. There we go. There's my email address on the bottom. Yeah, it, it, you're right, guys. That's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, so may as well be me. So, people, once more, <laughs> Daniel, no, <laughs> I don't want to delegate. Um, once more, people, any questions on anything we've done in this webinar? Oh, you're very welcome, Maria. Very welcome. Okay, Scott, go well. Okay, Daniel, you're welcome. You're welcome, Sarah. Okay, Colin. 
Well, you're very welcome, Justin. You too, Tom. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it, Justin. <laughs> okay, guys, cheers, all the best, and when the weekend comes, have a good one. Okay, folks. As I say, anything that you might have an afterthought on, there's the email address. This should be on the slides in Moodle for you. So from me then, cheerio guys, all the best. And we see you, I believe it's on the 4th of March. 4th of March. So until then, stay well. And it's goodbye from me.